Howdy. Welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise, and I want to thank you for tuning in for some Texas history today. It has been a very busy start to the year. I know I've owed you this episode for a while, but life will sometimes get in the way, won't it? I I will say that I've got uh, the Wise About Texas production schedule laid out for the spring, and I've got some great stuff coming your way. I've had several meetings with several history organizations in the last month or so, and I'm going to be working on some great partnerships to bring you the best Texas history content that I can. I've also been down to the border since we've last spoken. I went down to Brownsville and McAllen, and I'm always inspired by the rich history and culture down there, so stay tuned and make sure and tell your Texas-loving friends about this podcast. Well, today we're going to conclude our peak at Texas in World War I with an episode I've called Service to Country and Service to Texas. And uh, as a reminder, some of these, uh, the content of the Texas and the Great War series has been based on uh, a program designed by the Supreme Court Historical Society. And we're going to talk today about individuals who served in the Great War and then continued that service to the state of Texas. And certainly uh, this episode will be a tribute to them, but it's also really a tribute to all the brave Americans who fought in the war to end all wars. So let's go back to the early 20th century and get wise about Texas. As a reminder, uh, part one of Texas in the Great War, we talked about the run-up to war and the role Texas played in that. In part two, we talked about training the troops and how Texas, and specifically Uh, All of Texas, certainly El Paso, other areas of the state, uh, but we focused on San Antonio becoming a large center for training troops for World War I that was really the start of uh, San Antonio becoming and remaining today one of the largest military bases for the United States. Today we're going to talk about individuals, and I'm going to start with a gentleman named Few Brewster. Few Brewster can trace his ancestry back to one of the pilgrims who came on the Mayflower named William Brewster. He was born in Williamson County, born in 1889. He graduated from high school in Colleen and ended up at the University of Texas where he got his undergraduate degree and law degree. He joined the Army in May of 1918 and was commissioned a second lieutenant because he had been a college graduate. The Army sent him to Camp Pike, Arkansas for officer training, and the Army discovered that he was uh, a very good trainee but also a good trainer, so he was assigned to train other troops and did so uh, in Michigan. He served honorably for the duration of the war, war, training our troops to ship out overseas and fight in some of the most bitter battles which occurred toward the end of the war. He returned uh, to private life and practice law in Temple. He was a county attorney in Bell County in the uh, 1919 to 1923. He became district attorney shortly after that. He became a district judge for 12 years after that in Bell County. He was also president of the Texas Bar Association, the State Bar of Texas, in 1940 to 1941. The Supreme Court appointed him to something called the Commission of Appeals, which assisted the Supreme Court in the disposition of cases. And then in 1945, that was wrapped up into the Supreme Court of Texas, increasing the size of the court to nine members. And Brewster thereby joined the Supreme Court of Texas. He won two elections in 1948 and 1954. And significantly, he authored an article advocating for the State Bar of Texas to fully integrate in the 50s. Uh, Justice Brewster resigned from the Supreme Court in 1957 uh, because he was in poor health and passed away later that year, October 1957. The next uh, individual I want to talk about was a gentleman named George Eastland Christian. Christian was born in January of 1888. He was born in Burnett. He enlisted in the Army, but he was a little bit older than your typical enlistee and was already a practicing lawyer, so the Army commissioned him as an officer. He 
because he was an officer, he was sent to Camp Funston, which is one of those areas we talked about in Part 2. And he was placed in the 90th Infantry Division. Now, the 90th Infantry Division uh, was originally called the Texas-Oklahoma Division. And they wore a patch on their sleeve that said T and O. But soldiers being soldiers, they soon gave nicknames to their division. Uh, several of the nicknames included the Alamo Division, uh, playing off the TNO patch, they called him Texas's own, even though there were Oklahomans in the group. Uh, another one, my favorite, maybe, was Tough Hombres. And as you might imagine, the 90th was fairly proud of. So Christian graduated uh, from Camp Funston from for what was called First Officer's Training. We discussed that in Part 2. Christian shipped out on a, a ship for Europe. And these guys that had to travel on these ships were escorted across the Atlantic in these these uh, convoys had to zigzag constantly because of the German submarine threat. He got to Europe and was assigned as a company commander in the 344th Machine Gun Battalion, just in time to fight in a battle to capture saint mihiel France, where General Pershing, the American commander, was determined to finally crush the German army. Christian and his fellow soldiers were successful. They ended up capturing 15,000 Germans as prisoners, uh, unfortunately losing 9,000 men killed or wounded or missing in that same battle, one of the toughest battles of the war. A couple of significant military figures participated in this action. One was Brig then Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur. Another was then Lieutenant Colonel George S. Patton. Christian was to see more action up to Armistice Day. He was then made uh, promoted to first lieutenant and was uh, made part of the occupying force. He was discharged from the Army and returned to Texas in 1919. He became very active in politics. He worked on the campaigns of uh, soon-to-be Governor Dan Moody and another Governor James V. Allred, both of those World War I veterans as well. He continued in the private practice of law. Um, Governor Dan Moody, or then Attorney General Dan Moody, uh, brought on Christian as an assistant attorney general and was put in charge of investigating some irregularities in the highway department. In 1927, and by now uh, Dan Moody was governor, Moody appointed Christian to the commission of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Now, uh, Texas has two highest courts, one the Texas Supreme Court for civil matters, one the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals for criminal matters. I mentioned the commission in the previous profile for Justice Few Brewster, uh, for the Supreme Court, this was for the Court of Criminal Appeals. Christian was serving as a as a judge on that court, on that commission, uh, when he died at the young age of 53. He certainly served with distinction, uh, both the United States as a soldier and Texas, as assistant attorney general and a judge. Finally, I want to talk about a governor, Buford H. Jester. Governor Jester was actually the son of a lieutenant governor, George Taylor Jester, who served in the 1800s. Governor Jester was born in 1893. He graduated from the University of Texas in 1915 and chose to and qualified to attend Harvard Law School, which he did. He was in school when his country entered the Great War in 1917. He could have stayed in school and uh, probably would have had a very successful career, but service to country was more important and he enlisted in the United States Army, and he returned to Texas to do so. Jester was assigned to the first officer's training uh, that occurred in Leon Springs outside of San Antonio. Like George Christian, uh, Jester was assigned to the 90th Division. His uh, brigade was the 179th Infantry. Now, I mentioned he had enlisted, uh, so he began uh, his Army career as a private, but in six weeks, he had become a captain. That was uh, two things. One, he was a college graduate, so qualified to be a lieutenant, but uh, his leadership abilities earned him the rank of captain rather quickly. He sailed to Europe in June 2018 and uh, faced also faced the German submarine threat I described earlier, but we have some correspondence from Governor Jester describing some of his experiences. Now, all this correspondence would have been censored, um, but I want to read you part of a letter that Governor Jester sent to his parents. Talking about his voyage over to Europe, 
He wrote, quote, censorship forbids any disclosures relative to any events incident to the trip. But I may be able to tell you that we had a real thrill two days before we got in here. It was our first touch of the real stuff. This hint is all I can drop, close quote. So no doubt they were attacked by German submarines. But they made it and arrived in April of 18. When they arrived, and, and I've seen this letter also, um, all the officers got a letter from King George V of England. This letter is handwritten and reads as follows, quote, Soldiers of the United States, the people of the British Isles welcome you and your army to take your stand beside the armies of many nations now fighting in the old world, the great battle for human freedom. The Allies will gain new hearts and spirit in your company. I wish that I could shake the hand of each one of you and bid you Godspeed on your mission. Signed, George R.I., which stands for Rex Imperator, April 1918. And that letter uh, survives. I've held it in uh, Governor Jester's private papers. It's a really great artifact. Governor Jester saw action like Judge Christian in the battle for saint mihiel Salient and the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. I apologize for my French pronunciation. The, the author of the article that I drew much of this material from, Judge Mark Davidson, is, will harshly criticize that pronunciation, but uh, we'll deal with that later. Anyway, those were two of the most vicious battles of World War I. Governor Jester was there. On October 23rd, the uh, Allies were attacked. Captain Jester's company was, was attacked by the Germans, and they received a large dose of one of the most vicious weapons ever used, mustard gas, which was used liberally in World War I. And uh, Governor Jester was gassed, and uh, then Captain Jester was gassed, but he refused to leave his men. The mustard gas was truly awful. Uh, it would kill you if you got enough of it, but uh, most men didn't die immediately from the dose they got. But what they got were severe rashes, respiratory pain, vomiting, burning, blistering. If it got on any exposed skin, it would cause blisters. It would also blind you, sometimes temporarily, often permanently. The insidious part of this mustard gas is it basically had no smell, so you weren't sure, you weren't, you didn't know right away that you were the victim of one of these attacks. Well, Governor Jester was, but he remained with his troops, and he remained with them through the armistice in November 1918. Jester also served in the Army of Occupation and uh, finally returned from Germany in May of 1919. Governor Jester came home. He wanted to complete his studies, uh, but he didn't go back to Harvard. He, he entered law school at the University of Texas and was actually, and that was 1920 when he got his law degree. In 1929, fellow Great War veteran and Governor Dan Moody appointed gesture to the Board of Regents of the University of Texas. He later in the 40s became um, a member of the Rail Texas Railroad Commission, which uh, governs railroads, but also the oil and gas industry in Texas. And in 1946, Buford Jester ran for governor. He won the race, but unfortunately would only serve as governor for two and a half years. On July 11th, 1949, Governor Buford Jester died at age 56, of a heart attack. He was on a train at the time. And what we now know is that if you inhale sulfur mustard, uh, which of course is mustard gas, that it is likely leads to cardiovascular disease. So it's highly likely that Governor Jester finally fell victim to the injuries that he received on the battlefield, uh, injuries that he ignored to continue to lead his men in combat. But even in his short time in office, he would uh, accomplish some prison reform. He would uh, begin the farm-to-market road program, which is highly important in Texas. And he also uh, designed and implemented a comprehensive school finance program, which is an issue we're talking about uh, the very day this episode is released. Governor Jester remains the only governor to have died in office and should be remembered for his selfless service to the United States as an Army officer, as well as his service as governor of Texas. Those are just a few of the men that served in the 90th Division and others from the great state of Texas. These men continued their service 
to their communities by serving their state when they returned. More than 5,000 Texans served in the Great War, and every single one of them deserves to be honored. I just wanted to put a quick glimpse into some of the men that continued their service even after facing some of the harshest combat conditions in world history. Now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you to, where, how you can see some of the things that we talked about in the episode. I uh, want to play off the last part and talk about San Antonio. I want to mention the Fort Sam Houston Museum in San Antonio, which will have some great exhibits. The National World War I Museum is located in Kansas City, Missouri, a fantastic museum with lots to offer, some insight into World War I. I also encourage you to visit the Texas State Cemetery on Navasota Street in Austin, Texas, just east of downtown, where you'll find the graves of uh, many World War I veterans, including some discussed in this episode. That's always a wonderful place to learn a lot about Texas history, just walking around and reading the grave markers. I want to give special mention to the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society, specifically the executive editor of the Journal of the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society, David Furlow. You can find David on Twitter at David A. Furlow, F-U-R-L-O-W, and he has lots of great uh, historical posts. I also want to mention Judge Mark Davidson. Now, Mark's not on Twitter, but uh, a great historian and author, and both of those gentlemen authored several articles on uh, World War I veterans who continued their service in Texas in the latest Texas Supreme Court Historical Society journal. You can find that journal online at www.texascourthistory.org, www.texascourthistory.org. You'll also find video of the special tribute the Texas Supreme Court played to the veterans of World War I. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks for listening as we concluded the series on Texas and the Great War. Uh, The production schedule should pick up fairly quickly. We've got some good episodes coming up. So subscribe. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends about it. We're on Facebook, uh, Wise About Texas Facebook page. Be sure and like and share that. And you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. Thanks for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. Until next time. God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.